If you grew up in America in the last 50 years, you've probably seen this. Or this. Or maybe even this. The Oregon Trail, one of the best-selling educational games of all time. It was created by three students and earned billions in revenue, but they never even got a penny from its success. Let's find out why. Our story begins back in the fall of 1971. Don Rawich was attending Carleton College in Minnesota. Don was a history major and wanted to be a teacher. So in his senior year, he had to participate in a special program in order to determine if he could do it. And eventually, if he could, the university would have him teach a class of his own at one of the schools in the district as a trial run. Wanting to teach is one thing, but being able to wrangle a class of 30 kids takes some serious commitment. We were all kids once, we know how horrible they can be. In this program is where Don met Bill Heinemann and Paul Dillenberger two math majors who also wanted to be teachers. As a part of this program, the three of them were all placed together in the same apartment, and they quickly became friends. By this time, Don had advanced far enough to where he was about to start teaching his own classes. Now, Don had a supervisor teacher who informed him, hey, by the way, you're going to be teaching the class the unit on America's westward expansion, and you have three weeks to prepare the whole thing. Now, Dawn could have easily said, great, done some light reading for a few weeks and then just tell the kids to sit quietly and read their textbooks all class. But anyone who has had a teacher like that knows it's not fun to put it nicely. But with three weeks left to prepare, could you really blame Dawn for taking the easy route? Well, if he did, this video probably wouldn't exist. Instead, Don thought up the idea of making a game for the kids to play that could teach them while keeping them engaged. Not a video game, but a board game. He created a massive map of the Western United States, drew in the Oregon Trail, and created cards that would determine what would happen to players as they made their way west along the trail. Don laid it all out in his apartment's living room and got to work. Pretty soon after, his roommates Bill and Paul came home. After seeing it, one of them said, it's cool, but it would be better on a computer. Which is what Bitcoin's creator must have said when he saw money for the first time. <laughs> Now, at the time, computers were just starting to become popular for educational purposes. You couldn't do much with them as there were very few programs that existed at the time, but you could use them to learn how to code your own programs. Now, the only people that could afford computers were well-funded universities and school districts, as they were still these massive room-sized pieces of equipment. The city of Minneapolis' school district had them and wanted to put these things to good use, so math majors at Carl and college could use them to learn how to code or write their own programs, which is what Bill and Paul did. But let's say they could turn Dawn's board game into a computer game. What use is it if the students at nearby elementary schools couldn't use it? Do you really want to shuttle 30 kids on a bus over to a big delicate piece of machinery that costs probably more than everything in their parents' bank accounts combined? No? Well, the school district allowed the nearby schools to make use of the computer remotely. Schools that had a dial-up connection could use a machine called a teletype to access the district's mainframe computer from anywhere. The teletype was like a typewriter on steroids. It had no screen and a keyboard. <laughs> You could send messages to the computer by typing words out onto the paper. From there, the computer would respond by printing its own words onto the paper. Now, at this point, Don was already a week into his three-week preparation time, and just so happened to know absolutely nothing about computers. But rather than continue working on the board game, he put all his faith in his roommates and told them to create the computer version of the game. And that's exactly what they did. In just two weeks, they had created version 1.0 of the Oregon Trail, and it was impressively complex. This chart on screen displays the entire flowchart of how the game was played. You had to manage resources, decide what paths to take, fend off bandits, diseases, and all sorts of problems. And hopefully, just maybe, you survive the expedition and make it to the end of the trail. The program not only worked, but it was a hit at the school Dawn taught at. The students loved playing the game and were actually retaining the information it taught them. Lines would form after school of kids who all wanted to try this game. But once Don's teaching trial was over for the year, that was it. 
he needed to get back to his own life at Carleton College. So Don printed out the program's code on a long scroll of paper and deleted the game from the computer entirely. The game sat on this paper in Don's desk drawer, and he wondered if he would ever need it again. Don graduated college soon after, and in 1974, he took a job at a newly formed government agency called MEC. It stood for Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium. They essentially existed to assist Minnesotan schools in bringing technology into their classrooms. When MEC formed, they also purchased their own mainframe computer, which they would share with the entire district. Don, when he arrived, looked through the computer's list of programs, all of which were accessible by the schools in the state. Some were good, others were, well, piles of shit. Not so good. Don, remembering that he still had a copy of the Oregon Trail game on that piece of paper, asked his superiors if he could add his program to the computer. They said, sure, why not? And soon after, he spent all weekend manually rewriting this code. Don realized that since the game was made in only two weeks previously, it wasn't the most historically accurate. So he put in the extra time to research more about the real life Oregon Trail and made some upgrades. When he published the game to the computer, it was again an immediate success. It was the most run program throughout the entire state by a massive margin. Some programs were ran hundreds of times a day, whereas the Oregon Trail was in the thousands. This went on for about five years, but in the background, a big unavoidable storm was brewing, the launch of personal computers. For about a thousand bucks, you could now get a powerful computer in your own home that didn't take up the size of a whole room. Mech realized that they were going to have to change the way they do things, because schools were without a doubt going to want to get their hands on these. So Mech formed a team that recoded their most successful applications to work with the Apple II home computer. Oddly enough, Don wasn't involved in the new version of the Oregon Trail, and the new team were actually the ones who came up with the now iconic phrase, you have died of dysentery. In a later interview, Don actually said he hates that quote, so it sort of ruins the meme for some people, so I'm sorry if it did for you. Now, the version they created was fairly simple by today's terms, but definitely an improvement from its predecessor. Once the game was ready, Mech began selling Apple IIs to schools in the district at a discount through a contract, and along with it came free copies of their software like Oregon Trail, all placed on floppy disks. Now, this whole thing was pretty unheard of at the time. Minnesota's school district was far beyond others everywhere else in the US. So when other states caught on, they wanted to copy them. Following in Minnesota's footsteps, they started purchasing Apple IIs for their school districts, but they didn't have the software that Minnesota did. At this point, the Minnesotan government wanted Mech to be more self-supporting, as it was the perfect time to do so. So Mech decided to start selling their software to the other 49 states. Now, this might come as a shocker, but the Oregon Trail took off again. But there was a slight problem, piracy. So the game's later versions had a feature where you could see the tombstones of past players. Players could put in their name and a brief memento about their life. It would then save that to the computer and future players could come across it. Many players encountered a tombstone from someone named Andy, who simply wrote pepperoni and cheese, but it was horribly misspelled. It was believed to be a reference made by the game developers to this tombstone pizza commercial. What do you want on your tombstone? Pepperoni and cheese. Time for Tombstone Pizza. But it wasn't made by the developers at all. So how did so many people run into it? Well, because every tombstone is saved to the computer, if you theoretically moved that copy of the game to another computer, all the old tombstones would come with it. So Andy, whoever he was, likely broke through the Oregon Trail's piracy prevention, played a round of the game, and wrote that tombstone. They then burned that copy to some floppy disks and either sold it somewhere or gave it away. From there, this copy spread all over the nation, and along with it, Andy's weird tombstone. This version was legitimately everywhere, even in schools. So if you encountered this message while playing, you were playing on a pirated copy. So your school might have some explaining to do. But even widespread piracy didn't put much of a dent in mech's profits, especially once they started allowing schools to make as many copies of the game as they wanted after purchasing it once. A decade and a few Oregon Trail versions later, Mech was bought out by another company for 5.25 
$5 million. This may sound like a lot, but the state of Minnesota made a terrible deal. At the time, the Oregon Trail accounted for roughly one third of the organization's profits. When Mech's new owner listed themselves on a stock exchange soon after, the public learned that they were making about 30 million in yearly revenue, with the Oregon Trail accounting for 10 million of it. But if you think that's crazy, five years later, Mech was sold again for $370 million to a company called SoftKey. Again, with the Oregon Trail being the main selling point but it gets even crazier. In 1999, Mattel bought SoftKey, now known as The Learning Company, for a mind-blowing $3.8 billion. The Oregon Trail was so big, it was impossible to avoid. It seems like nearly every kid in America had played it, or at the very least had heard of it. It was in every computer store, and even stores like Target started carrying it. So you might be wondering, how much did its creators earn from all this? Well, nothing. When Don originally rewrote the Oregon Trail's code and published it on Mech's mainframe computer, he hadn't made any deal like, okay, so this is my game, I want to earn money from it. In fact, he hadn't even consulted its other two creators, Bill or Paul. So when the game was uploaded to that computer, any chance of earning a penny from it was over. The game was now the property of Minnesota. In fact, none of the creators were even given recognition for being the game's creators until 1991. A ceremony was held at the Mall of America, where they were given the most 90s thing you could imagine, matching jean jackets and new copies of the game. But that's it. In later versions of the game, they weren't even in the credits. If the three of them had struck some sort of deal with the state and tried to earn some money off this thing, they'd easily be millionaires, no doubt. As of 2011, the game has sold over 65 million copies and raked in hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of dollars for its owner. But the three creators seem to be okay with that, at least publicly. But that doesn't mean they've forgotten just how much they could have made. Don't forget to ask me about the, uh, the money we didn't get. We always wondered, you know, why didn't we get any money for any of that? These days, they all seem to be doing fairly okay for themselves. Although they didn't make money from the game directly, they've been invited to speak at conferences and be in documentaries. They all created this game as teachers who just wanted to share their knowledge with the world. And they did exactly that.